Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tonic Accord podcast. As we are now in August of this election year, I am sure you are starting to get bombarded by political ads. Today, we're going to take a look at uh, a kind of pull the curtain back behind the scenes of the political advertising industry, since I do work in it myself. And we're also going to take a look at the good, the bad, and also the kind of hilarious uh, political ads that we've seen in the past, the present, and, and um, just kind of judge them and take a look and maybe have a laugh. So stick, stay tuned, and we're, let's dive into political advertising. All right, so um, let's let's get into it. Um, first off, you know, uh, just a little background. Like I work for a company called Ampersand, and we deal with um, placement of political ads as regards to cable and, and we handle clients of uh, all parties or and, and packs and so this 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 kind of topic is especially something i know a little bit about i've been working for ampersand since 2018 so i've been i've been through this will be this is my second political cycle with them and uh, I, I do have to say it's been it's kind of crazy to see um kind of what goes on behind closed doors as far as pack money uh, the amount of agencies that they hire to get to voters, the amount of data that is shared and um, used to get to the correct voters. Um, it's been certainly fascinating. But, um, yeah, I guess I guess really my my big claim for this this episode is is that, you know, there is a lot of money in politics and a lot of it is hard to follow. And I'm sure a lot of people know that, but it's really in, crazy to see it firsthand. Yeah, I I think it's nice that we're finally going to talk about this on here just because, you know, we do have the luxury of having you who is, you know, you're building up your experience doing this stuff and off the air, you've been telling me, it sounds like you've been really busy. So I guess maybe for people who don't, don't follow it as closely as you do for sure, what has made the last few months busy? I know that sounds like a stupid question, but why has it gotten so hectic? Yeah, well, um, you know, we've had a, a slew of primaries. I mean, I was I was really busy for a while. The the company I work with, Ampersand, you know, on the I was assigned to the account of Bernie Sanders actually, Bernie Sanders campaign and his agency, which uh, it's public knowledge, so I can say it. It's called Blue West Media, which is which it was his you know cable ad buying agency he hired to do all these things that they then came to us for help. Uh, I, there's a long there's a lot of middlemen in this industry, um, but. Yeah, the, you know, first it was like the Iowa caucus uh, and all those primaries, all the Democratic candidates trying to get their ads out to try and win over, you know, Iowa, uh, New Hampshire, uh, those those early states, um, California, even this year, at least. Um, and then it kind of died down a bit after after like the main Democratic primaries for a couple months. But the last few months, probably since, you know, since July, beginning of July, it's starting to ramp up again. Um, and now we're looking at the general, you know, we're looking at the general election. So you have, you know, of course, everyone thinks about Trump and Biden, which both are spending in, you know, Biden, especially is spending in record numbers. I think he just signed on the largest political ad buy of any presidential candidate in history. Um, you know, and but what people don't often think about is, you know, all the little guys, right? Uh, not just congr- congressmen and senators, but, you know, state senators, uh, state representatives, school councils, you know, all the little little things that you may not even think of that, you know, unless you're in that district or in that, you know, school zone, but they, they, they buy political ads too, and they need them. And, um, it's ramping up for everybody now. It's not just political, uh, presidential candidates. Um, it's not just Michael Bloomberg buying billions of dollars. It's, 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 presidential candidates making up huge million dollar buys but then there's state senators buying forty thousand dollars here sixty thousand dollars here whatever they can kind of muster to benefit their campaign but if you have that happen a couple thousand times it it adds up yeah i think i mean just just i i love to watch youtube at night and i think i've learned more than i need to about candidates i didn't even know existed you know i mean the amount of new ad space that is coming out now is just, just you know, just pretty insane. So, like, do you think? Because I know politically, like, if you turn on Fox or CNN or whatever, whatever media site, they're gonna tell you, you know, this is the most important election in our lifetimes, and this is, you know, this is something new. It's like, it's like Trump versus Biden. Like, this is an unprecedented election. Like, advertising-wise, do you think it's an unprecedented election, or is it just kind of the same old as every time? 
Um, the, I think the unprecedentedness is in the digital space. I think cable buys, the, 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 the ads you see on Fox News, the ads you see on CNN, they're going to be relatively the same. They're going to be mostly highly produced. Um, you know, there's going to be, as a result of tons of polling by, you know, real political pollsters and political media groups. But I think that the difference is now is um, we're also seeing a new kind of political ad come up in the digital space, the, the 15 second Instagram ad. And that it looks like just someone holding their phone. It's not a super well-produced thing. It could just be someone holding their phone saying, you know, ah, I'm a Republican, but I don't like Trump. And it looks authentic. Um, that kind of thing, I think, is new, uh, as, well, as well as the lack of censorship. If you have a political ad uh, online, you can say things like the F word. You can say swear words. You can say things, and which, um, you know, we'll get, we'll, we can get into a little bit later. But the Lincoln Project has ads that have swear words. Um, and you're not limited by... Uh, the 30 second cable spot or the 60 ca second cable spot you know you can have ads that are minutes long which i think you know you've you've selected one to show later that's you know over five minutes long yeah. so it, it's in this digital space on youtube twitter um you know getting reblogged by like the twitter verse is really big now um that kind of thing i think is is changing the political ad dynamic but let's remember that the average american especially the more politically active generally are older they're still watching cable uh, and and the political ad money that we see in cable, you know, everyone says, oh, cable's dying. Well, not maybe, maybe, you know, with certain shows, but not in political ad, especially not in political ad spending. Um, you know, we're seeing record numbers this year that are just blowing 2016 and 2018 out of the water. Um, you know, and, and you're seeing people like again, like Michael Bloomberg spending into the billions in, in ads. It's 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 it is really I think that is what it's unprecedented the most is the the spending I think it's gonna be the largest year ever for political ad spending and then on top of that the digital space is kind of changing the rules. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, no, you're you're right. I remember when I saw how much Michael Bloomberg was putting into his own campaign. I was like, holy crap! Like that is first off, I don't know if that was economically a good idea for him. If you know, in all, at all, but right. it, it is fascinating. And no, I would I would agree with you that I think. That's more the unprecedented part of this. And what what I always wonder, and like this is a little bit in a different direction now, but like, you know, a lot of other countries, like European countries, Asian countries, I mean, obviously they have elections, most of them, except for these remaining authoritarian places, but they don't really seem to allow like this amount of money and this long of an election cycle. Like, do you think that it's a positive in the US that political advertising has this much money that goes into it? Or do you think it's kind of a negative to our system? Because it's definitely a unique system we have here, like, you know, the 24 hour 365 campaign. Yeah, well, I think um, I think it's pro like overall, as far as like our democracy and everything, it's it, I think it's probably a bad thing. Um, I mean, personally, it pays my bills. Right. So <laughs> I think, you know, in that sense, it's a good thing. A good but uh, <laughs> but I think in, I think for democracy, it's a bad thing. And I think the reason we we have you know, specifically in advertising, such a big thing in the United States is one, I think America has had an advertising culture for a while, since like the 1950s. Um, but on top of that, I think that the the, the tax codes, that the 501Cs and the 501Bs that allow for super PACs to have an immense spending power and influence on our elections, um, that they pay for a lot of the ads. You have to remember, right, that, it, you know, it, not every Joe Biden ad is paid for by Joe Biden's campaign. A lot of them, you know, I think he has a, his one of his super PACs is called Unite the Country. They, they've spent a ton of money. Um, there's a, a pro-Trump pack called uh, Club for Growth Action. They spend a ton of money and they target, you know, they, they try and boost pro-Trump Republicans. They're not tied to or limited by the campaign strategies or the spending limits or the, um, you know, the individual donation caps that official campaigns are they're the kind of these tax loopholes that we allow in this country to have you know almost unlimited spending power uh to us to a certain extent and and that i think is what drives such a massive political advertising industry that comes up every cycle yeah we have there's political ads in the uk and europe and you know any other place where there's a competition for elected office but the, that's the reason we see it on a different scale here in the United States. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 
it's fascinating because yeah i mean i i think like you know i mean like you said there's advertising everywhere but it, it's just it's just fascinating to me like how intrinsic it seems to be in our politics and but i think you're right is that kind of since the golden age, or i mean the 19th 20th century golden age i mean advertising is kind of part of the american capitalism so it does yeah. does make sense i guess in that one and I guess the last question I have for you, just because this has always been something that I'm personally curious about, and if I'm curious about it, I'm sure people that maybe don't follow, follow politics are as well, is that, say, your company, for example, are you guys a partisan company, or do you go, do you pursue advertising campaigns for both, say, Republican pe people and Democrats? Because I think a lot of us think, oh, you know, an ad company, they're only going to be Democrat, they're only going to be Republican. Like, does your company take ads for both sides? Um, mine does, but mine is not the, like, we don't deal with the creative part. We're not the one making the ad. We don't decide what the ad's message is. What we deal with is okay. the more logistical part of putting up that ad at the, in the correct space to get to the targeted voters. Um, so, for example, if, if, you know, an agency comes to us and they want Republicans 35 and up, uh, and, and on cable, we'll say, well, we, we, you know, based on the data that we have, Republicans age 35 and up that make over 100K a year uh, in a household, they, turn, they generally watch History Channel, ESPN, ESPN2, Fox News, right? We'll let them know, hey, this is where you need to be. This is what we recommend. And we'll, re we'll negotiate the price and the rates of the ads and then we'll put it there. My company personally, well, not personally, but my company um, takes agencies from all sides but there are media agencies that are very partisan and we call them dem shops or republican shops um you know and 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 they'll only take you know republicans and some of them will only take trump republicans some will only take establishment republicans you know um that blue west media i talked about who was um hired by bernie sanders to handle some of his um ads they're 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 a dem shop they're blue west they only handle with blue candidates but that's not always the case there are definitely agencies that just go where the money is and of course you know a lot of them then come to us and and we just kind of take clients as we get um so it certainly is it's it's mixed between people that are you know really gung-ho partisan wise or just people that are just you know it's an industry and they're just making money in it yeah yeah that's that's interesting because i don't know like growing up especially i think you just assume that every company is kind of in it for the you know the politics more than the actual like numbers game and no i mean it, yeah I, I could definitely see it being both things for I, sure for i sure. have i have an anecdote that i i don't want to put anyone in trouble or anything so i'm not going to say any names or what agency it is but there is an agency there is an agency that's ve that, that solely takes republican candidates only only red and I, I personally know the people that work in that agency are all Democrats. So, <laughs> so there are definitely people that are just here because it's a, a lucrative industry. You know, I, 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 I personally know people that just put their political opinions aside and, and chase the money. Now, you can, you can debate the merits of that all you want, but, um, uh, you know, that's, that's what it is. Uh, and, and again, like I said, uh, in the, at least in the cable space and as well as the digital space, it's only growing. There's only more and more money every election cycle that we're seeing being spent. And, 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 and the way our system works right now is I don't see there's a limit to it. It's just going to keep going that way. Oh, yeah. I, th I think we got to get ready because it's just, it's just going to keep coming for sure. And I mean, so I don't know if you have anything else like specifically you want to talk about, but I, I would be like just because of kind of the time we're in right now, you know, I, I think it would be fun to just kind of look at some ads past past and present, you know, just to kind of maybe see, like me, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand if there's a common theme or trend in successful ads. And you could probably tell me that's BS, I'm sure. But I, I do wonder if there's like a specific formula that works. Well, I think there's a framework we'll, we should use to at least judge some of these ads. And, and maybe that's kind of what you're talking about, right? A, a formula. I think one is an ad needs to know its target audience. It needs to know who they're trying to, to trying to talk to, right? Um, um, especially in politics, you know, especially in politics, especially with the way our system works with first past the post, you don't need to convince everybody. You just need to convince the right people. And so you have to make sure your ads are targeting that right people uh, to try and persuade them. 
I think that there's a couple other things. Um, one is often I think successful ads have what's called a permission structure, especially if you're trying to convince people on the other side of the aisle of something. You want you and you don't want to talk down to them. You want to give them permission to change their opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I think I, I'll show you some examples that I of, of ads that I picked that have that and some that don't. Um, and then I think that production quality is important, but it's also changing. Like I said, is I think, you know, good production quality you would think is always good. But I also think that now with the Instagram ad, having maybe less production quality and more authentic people with their phones in their kitchens can lead to authenticity and, and perhaps more persuasion. And then I think the last thing is facts or feelings. I, I think that we often think that facts are the best way to persuade someone of, an, of their an opinion, and I don't agree with that. I think the best political ads are the ones that leave us with feelings, um, coming away with a feeling of, you know, of anger or a feeling of hope. Those are way more effective than any that just list off facts. Yeah, and before we before we get going, you know, that's I, I think that's completely accurate there, and it's something that I've always found kind of ironic is that. You know, you have people like Ben Shapiro and a lot of these kind of fiscal hawk conservatives who always say facts don't have feelings. You know, we need to have a facts based approach. But it's funny because literally most conservatives, especially like the Trump sycophant ones and Trump himself, just it seems to be the opposite. Right. Like there's no facts in there. It's all about appealing to your emotional strength and your emotional just leanings. And it it is interesting because I, I think I think in a nutshell for certain debate you would think fact is better, but you're right with advertising. No, I think right. it's about trying to. I don't want to say appeal to the lowest common denominator because that's not always the case, but I think it's easier the race to the bottom than the race to facts. Yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, political advertising is not a debate, right? Like you know that whole facts thing is a debate tactic. Political ads isn't a debate. There's no one. There's no one on the other like. It's not a back and forth. You have 30 seconds to, to persuade someone. You're going to do whatever it takes to persuade them. And oftentimes it's, it's, a, it's, it's trying to appeal to emotions of a certain kind. And everybody does it. It's not a partisan thing. You know, it's, that's just advertising. Um, yeah. You know, if you had an, a Coke advertising that said, this is the sugar content. This is the this content. <laughs> that's the, no one cares. You want the Coca-Cola ad with the cool hip kids by the beach having summer fun, and then you see them drink a Coke because that gives you a feeling of oh, I want to have fun too. So um, yeah, yeah, so let's let's dive into some. I wanted to start one off with, um, and and I, but when we do get into these, I do want to I want to kind of have the framework of not necessarily going at what we agree with or disagree with in the content right, wise, right. but as is this an effective ad? and or not and why so this first one is from from donald trump uh, and it's called american comeback i'm donald trump and i approve this message my administration oh will yeah all necessary steps to safeguard our citizens from this threat hysterical xenophobia giving americans a false sense. is it accurate that if these uh, steps had not been put in place it could have been two million True. people dead here in the united states yes no matter how hard try to stop us they can't we built the greatest economy the world has ever seen and we're going to do it again <laughs> together we're beating back the invisible enemy what the federal government did was a phenomenal accomplishment through it all the world has witnessed the unyielding resolve of our incredible american people promise made promise kept and i'm fighting for you and i love doing it with everything that i have and you know that. With the grace of God, we will win this war, and we will win this war quickly. And we will make America great again. All right. Hmm. Huh. Well, I mean, I think it's an effective ad if you're not watching the news. Um, yeah. But Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Yeah, but no, I mean, I, I think it is an effective ad because clearly we're at the point where that's what Trump needs to run on is the economy was good before I came into office. We have had some tough times and one side is trying to stop us from a comeback. I mean, I, I, I think it's I think it's smart us versus them politics again with Trump. But this one has some rosy video footage of kind of, you know, your frontline workers and everything. And so it appeals to motion to emotion and it divides, but in a very clever way. And I think that's one of Trump's skills in general politically is to divide but also not blatantly divide sometimes yeah i think you said like the rosy footage i think that 
um, it's a smart move for Trump to try and focus on the positive. I think there's been a lot, like a lot of negative in 2020, right? Um, and he's also known for for negative tweets about people and being kind of an a hole, frankly, online. Uh, but this this is a lot of like hope, right? The great American comeback. And I think the big thing for me that was convinced me that this is a good ad for him is that permission structure. He had Gavin Newsom, a Democrat, say, promise made, promise kept. He had, you know, Cuomo, a Democrat and from New York, say, you know, what the federal government did was, you know, exceptional I'm, or whatever he said. It was something along those lines. That is that permission structure I'm talking about. It's, hey, look, there's are, these are Democrats saying good things about Trump. You might be a Democrat that could say the same thing or 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 a middle of the, you know, the middle, the independent. That's like, well, OK, I mean, even some Democrats agree that he did some good things. It's that permission structure because this is not going to his base. I mean, his base, his base already hate Gavin Newsom and Andrew Cuomo. Like, Why would he put them in an ad unless he's trying to convince the middle and the middle left? So that's that permission structure of like you're a lot like I'm giving you permission to change your opinion, even though you identify as a Democrat. Um Really strong. I think this is a, a good ad. It's a 60 second spot. It's short, quick to the point, um, and it and it, and it paints Donald Trump in a, in a in a positive light, which con, which is you know contrary to what the news has been saying. Yeah, yeah. No, I I definitely agree. And so, what would you give it out of uh, like A B C D F? What would you give it? Um, you know, B plus, A minus. You know, um, I don't think it's like the best ad ever, but I do think I do think it's a strong ad for his campaign, especially the fact that he had Democrats in it saying good things about him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, there's there's one that I sent you, which which I think I, I'm curious your opinion on it. It's the Brian Kemp one. Did you get that link? I think I put it up. Yeah. Uh, Here, let me snag it real quick. OK, cool. Yeah, you can just put in put in Brian Kemp ad i think would even work probably right uh, because i think here we go i got it a good up. one Hi, hold on, i'll restart Perfect. it um let me go back to our call too awesome okay um, so conservative all right let's take a look i'm brian kemp i'm so conservative i blow up government spending i own guns no one's taken away. <laughs> My chainsaw's ready to rip up some regulations. I got a big truck. Just in case I need to round up criminal illegals and take them home myself. Yep, I just said that. <laughs> I'm Brian Kemp. If you want a politically incorrect conservative, that's me. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. <Brian Kemp>. Great, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um... So what do you think on that one? <laughs> well, obviously his target audience is his his deeply conservative base. Um, let's see. He is, yeah, Kemp for governor, governor of Georgia. So he's obviously, he's speaking to Georgians, and it's particularly Republican-leaning Georgians. Um, you know, I'm a politically incorrect conservative. That's me. Yes, I really did just say that. My truck, my guns. It's pretty obvious who he's trying to attract by this ad. He's not going for – he's not trying to reach across the aisle and, and pick up like maybe center-left people. He's, he's trying to rally up his base probably because that's all he needs to do, right? He probably just needs to get enough conservative Republicans to get out to vote to win Georgia, which is a generally conservative Republican state. So – um, as far as his target audience, pretty obvious. I think he, I think he tries. I think he hits the nail on the head as far as what his target audience wants. Um, it's a little bit goofy and self-aware. Like, yeah, he says, yeah, I, I did just say that as he's talking about like deporting criminal illegals. So, I mean, as far as you know, I think it's cringy. But as far as what he he's trying to accomplish, I, I think it I think it's probably effective. He's probably had a polling team because this is you know a governor level. You have you probably have a whole media team that does polling for you. He's probably polled every single one of these points. You know, deporting criminal legals probably polled well with Georgia Republicans. The gun things definitely polls well with Georgia Republicans. Being being politically incorrect polled well. So he just probably went down the line and just said all those things back that his polling gave him. Yeah, yeah, that's what, definitely what it seems like. <laughs> and and I think I think the key for me in this too was this was a midterm election right back in 2018. 
So I, I feel like midterms in general are less about trying to, you know, ask for permission from the other side, kind of like you were talking about. I feel like those are just getting out your base, right? Yeah. And, and, and this seems like literally he just pulled the sword out of the stone in the culture war. Um, you know, he brings up every culture war issue possible, and it's, it's just kind of interesting. But I, I definitely agree with you. Uh, obviously, he did win this election, so it definitely worked. He knew what he was looking for. Ironically, a lot of the stuff he cut and a lot of the things he doesn't believe in probably could have helped with coronavirus. But like you said, we're not going to get into the politics on this. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, let's let's go on to the All right, first. What would you give this A, B, C, D, F? No, no, C plus. I think it does the okay. job. It's not. It's not amazing, but it's pretty much just l- l- listing off the, what his pollsters told him to say in a funny way. I mean, it probably was effective to his base, and I guess that's what he wanted. It's interesting how you see uh, the online like his base probably loved this ad, but online he has almost you know seven point one thousand likes, but five point one thousand dislikes. Um, yeah, it's yeah. just it's interesting that you know the internet can be kind of brutal, but it. But for someone like him, who, he probably doesn't care. He's like, yeah, whatever. My YouTube video can get as many dislikes as it wants as long as I win my election. Yeah. Um, yeah, see- and, and ironically, that, like, sorry, that, that 7 to 5, basically, like 7,000 to 5,000 is probably exactly how he won the election. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, okay, that was an interesting one, you know. Uh, let's go a little. Let's go a little bit farther, <laughs> a little bit funnier. This one is just kind of stupid. Oh, actually, look at this. I have a political ad. What do you know? Do you approve of Donald Trump? Take no the way. survey. Oh, it's just a survey ad. Okay. I'll, text. I will. Those uh, are so annoying. They're I, SNL. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so this is Trump Ted Cruz's machine gun bacon snippet. I don't think this was like a, a an official like thirty second spot cable ad, but this was definitely part of his media promotion that he put on online back in twenty sixteen, and in my view that counts, right? Because you know, you're a walking advertisement when you're on, on the campaign trail. So this is Ted Cruz's machine gun bacon. Texas. Mm-hmm. We cook bacon a little differently than most folks. <laughs> yum, yum, yum. Machine gun bacon. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, Well, machine gun bacon, I mean, I I prefer machine gun Kelly when you put that, like, like a nice. sequence of words together, but you know, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think again, this is one of those significant political ads that's making a statement about culture and kind of where he stands with American values, right? Bacon, super American, uh, gun, <laughs> clearly, clearly, uh, you, you know, he's appealing to his second amendment, you know, supporters and, I I don't think he's again trying to go across the aisle here, but I think in a state like I think this goes back to what we're talking about with the Georgia one as well. In the state like Georgia and Texas, if you're a conservative running a, for either re-election or for office, I don't think you're trying to really particularly gain new voters. Now that could change, obviously going forward as demographics change, but I think right now you're just trying to reconsolidate your base and just kind of reaffirm to them that you are there for their causes. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely trying to do that. I think he fails. I think that, te- like, first of all, like, <laughs> Ted Cruz <laughs> has a Ted Cruz has a reputation of being kind of a smarmy little prick, and that's even among Republicans. Like, that's like other Republicans think he's a smarmy prick. Um, he's he's one of the most hated men in Congress, and it's pretty well known that he is just like a smarmy prick. Uh, and I think he's trying to go against that image of like I like guns and I like bacon, but he does he doesn't come across to me as someone that is like that. Like the Brian Kemp, at least seems like a guy that would drive a truck and that would have a gun and that would talk like that. Ted Cruz is the opposite. He doesn't seem like a guy that enjoys firearms. Doesn't seem like a guy that's like Texas strong Ford trucks. He just you know he. 
he, people vote for him in Texas because he, he you know, he upholds pro, pro-life and he's, you know, he tries to have strong borders against immigrants. Um, but I don't think people in Texas vote for him because they think he's some strong, tough Texas cowboy. And I think this fails. Um, uh, now, Texas Democrat, Texas is demographics are changing. And so and that's not because of this ad, obviously. But I don't think Ted Cruz would ad, would run an ad like this again, because I don't th- I don't think it works. I think it's cringy. It became kind of a meme back in 2016, and uh, yeah, he just doesn't he just doesn't portray it well. It's weird. He, he even ends it on like chewing and going like yeah, mm. it's like what? I don't know. It's strange. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you that he is notorious for being kind of a slimy guy, kind of an oddball, kind of cutthroat. I've, I've, I've heard every negative adjective about him, uh, though I would push back and say that I don't think it really matters if he's if you and I see him as a gun toting Texan. I, I think I think his base and a lot of Texans probably still find that important. Uh, especially in 2016, I'm, I'm guessing this was what like back during the during the big election between Trump and Hillary, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I, I almost just see that as kind of him acknowledging his commitment to the conservative cause. And so I, I agree with you. I think it's a horrible ad, but I bet you that there are people inside of Texas that they went well. At least Ted's reminding me that like he might be a sleazy kind of creep, but he's reminding me of why I'm going to vote for him. That's true. I mean, that's true. I just don't think he needs it. I just don't think he needs no. to be a gun-toting, bacon-eating guy to win Texas. He just needs to be oh, pro- pro-life and anti-immigration you know, immigration and, and that kind of thing. Um, but I don't know. I, 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 just, I see it as a failed attempt at changing Ted Cruz's image because today no one considers him – four years later, no one considers him anything like this kind of person. He's, he's, a, he's a Washington insider as it gets. Um, yeah. Okay, we are running a little bit low on time. Is there, we want to do like one more each and then get out of here for this episode at least? Yes, perfect. So I'm I'm stuck between one. Would you rather do one about a guy comparing uh, donkeys to jackasses, and a.k.a. Democrats, or Ron DeSantis? Um, well, you, you pick, man. It's your choice, but they both sound good. All right. That's, I, I think a lot of people have seen the Ron DeSantis one, which is where he's basically telling his kids about how great you – know, he's reading them a children's book about building the wall and everything Trump's done, yeah. indoctrinating his children. I think a lot of people have seen that. So let's do this one. Um, it is – Roger let Williams? Me, let me make, it's the Roger Williams one, exactly. You're not it's, a victim. it's from 2013, so it's kind of when, the, when that red wave hit Congress after Obama's first term. And it's clearly, uh, it's a very weird metaphor. So yeah, let's dive into that and see. I, it's cringy, man. Oh, let's you're do it. You're, you're a patriot. You're an opportunist. Let's take advantage of it, okay? Let's do it. They don't listen to me. You know, I've been talking to these guys forever, and they still do not listen. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, all these guys want is they, they want more shelter, they want more feed, but yet the government's making it harder on me, they're taxing me to death. Uh, I can't afford to build that. When I don't build it, they think I owe it to them. See, all you guys want, I, I, you want a handout. I don't have something in it, now you're getting mad again, okay? Years ago, we didn't have this problem. Yeah, but now it's just a hassle to get them to do anything. Don't turn your head. I know you're embarrassed because you're part of the problem, all right? But we can turn it around. These donkeys don't live in the United States of France. They live in the United States of America. <laughs> They're going to have to get with it. You all heard me talk about the Constitution. Have you ever heard of the Constitution? It's a great document. They keep thinking that Obama's going to take care of them, Obama's going to feed them, Obama's going to build their barn. <laughs> Look, if I can get Obama out of health care and we stuck that, I can get these teeth fixed that you got, okay? I can get them fixed, all right? But he's got to get away. He's got to let me do the things I need to do. See those big ears? Still can't hear me. Unbelievable. <laughs> Nice. All right. Interesting, right? <laughs> yeah, it is interesting. You know what's interesting is like I feel like this is like kind of that trolling culture, but way before its time. You know, uh, super. It's super interesting to see like this kind of comedy from from a Republican candidate in, in back in the early 2010s. This is something I would expect more from Republicans now. Um, that kind of trolling vibe. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And like I to me, I think this is like the historical context kind of shows almost the pre-Trump 
Tea Party anger towards the left, which is kind of that pre-Trump trolling. Because you're right, like yeah. it's it's something you'd think you would see now, but it just shows, I think, where the growing resentment for Democrats and kind of owning the left was coming from, right? And honestly, like I don't agree with some of the things he says, but I think the metaphor is kind of genius. Yeah, so, yeah I, I, I think it's I think it's good. I think it's funny, and it's obviously. Like it's not doing the permission structure. It's not appealing to the 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 center left or anything. He's he's basically making he's making fun of Democrats. That's that's the whole thing. And he's he's appealing to his base. He's appealing to you know he's calling Democrats dense that not, they don't listen that they just want handouts right. Um, and I think I actually think this is an, it's this is an effective ad. I think it's funny. Um, I obviously yeah I, I obviously don't agree with him politically, but I think it is very clever. Um, Okay, that was super. Yeah, for like early early troll culture in politics right here. Um, so, I love it. so I had a bunch more. You had a couple bunch more uh, that we had too, which we could go all day. But I want to end on one that I think is really strong, and it kind of shows the um, the where is it? Um, shoot, where do I put it? Hold on, let me grab it up real quick. Um, this is from a veteran's. Here, hold on. Let me let me find it. A Republicans against Trump group. Republican voters against Trump. My name's here. Dan. It is. Here it is. Here it is. Oh, hold on. Too big. I love it. Um. So this Dan. is this is what I'm talking about as far as like the new style where you want to almost have more authenticity with people just in their kitchens on their phone. And I think this one kind of gets uh -huh. it. And it also de deals with that permission structure of veterans telling other veterans that they should believe in something. So let's take a look. Dan Kiesboltz, I'm a U.S. veteran, served in the Navy. I was an active duty Navy SEAL. Submarine officer. Air Force. Marine. I was raised as a Republican. I've been a lifelong Republican. Lifelong Republican. At least I was until Donald Trump came into the picture. He does not care about you. He does not care about this country. That Trump he doesn't care about the Constitution. He only cares about himself. Soldiers <laughs> expect their leaders to be able to do what they do, to be willing to take that risk. When it came time for him to serve in the Vietnam War, he got five deferments. Howard. We're looking at a lying draft dodger who berates those who serve our country on uh, rewards those who do not, lets them get off scot-free, people that lie to Congress, I mean, what in the hell? My friends are still out there and they're being targeted by the Russian Federation with, with aid bounties. For these reasons, I am supporting Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. I would not consider myself liberal, but Biden is the only choice. Country above party. Joe Biden. Biden. 2020. Go America. What do you think? Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's really effective uh, because of what you were talking about with kind of this format that's coming back where it's a little bit less official, probably still has a decent budget but doesn't appear like it. And I think it kind of cuts through the bullshit where I, I think a lot of Americans are sick of seeing these glitzy ads that they can't connect with. And I've talked to so many veteran conservatives, especially older conservatives, who feel the same way. So I think it's, I think it's authentic. And to me... It, it, it appeals not only to my emotion, but you're right. It goes back to that permission factor. And I, I, would, I would give that at least an A minus because it really does. And, and honestly, it's honest. There's, there's no making up stuff along the way. I agree. I agree. I mean, the big things like that, that one guy said, he's like, I wouldn't even consider myself a liberal, but Joe Biden's the only option. You know, and the other guy's saying, you know, I saw friends in, in Afghanistan that are being targeted because of Trump. Right. Um, you know, it's coming from veterans. It's the target is for veterans. Right. It's saying you know, Republican voters against Trump. Right. The, this is they're trying to persuade Republicans, center right, um, the you know military style guys. You know, you had, a, you had a guy in there that was a big, tough looking dude with a purple heart. Um, you know, they don't this is not this is not trying to get like the Twitter verse, you know, like cancel culture. This is trying to get conservatives. And I think it is really effective in that same way, like you're talking about. It's 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 real veterans with their phones. You know, obviously the editing and the the graphics are, are good, but it's just you know, just dudes with their phones, and they're talking about um, how they just won't vote for Trump, even though they are conservative. I think it's a pretty effective ad, and it has gone viral. I mean, this was posted you know a little a less than a week ago, uh, and it has 1.1 million views, which is the most on this channel. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you. And I think that's why we are going to see some really interesting ads right now is because Trump is not a typical Republican and this is not a typical time, right? And, and you know, I mean, 
we haven't even really talked about the Lincoln Project much, and I'm sure we can, we could really talk about that. But I think we are seeing these these conservative groups, especially that are, are fascinating because they're appealing to kind of the establishment conservative, kind of the old school conservative who maybe does feel like what's happening under Trump is a bit much, even if maybe they agree with his politics. And it's, it's fascinating for me to see. And like, you know, I mean, there's like, to me, this has a similar feel at least in the structure to some of the Lincoln project ones where it's like, there's one that six minute one I, sh- I shared with you where, There's a guy, you know, he wakes up from a coma or something and it's 2020 and he's been asleep since Trump got elected. And, you know, his family's conservative and they're talking about how great some parts of his politics are, but also just the horrid side of it. And that's going to be interesting to me, man. We're going to see if all the conservatives follow in line like in 2016 and these ads are kind of paving the way. Definitely. Definitely. Well said. Um, We should probably wrap this episode up. So, you know, we took a little bit of a gander at behind the scenes of you know, PACs and and how that money changes hands uh, in the political ad industry. And then we took a look at some of these uh, political ads. Let us know your thoughts are which ones are effective, which ones aren't. And um, we would love to hear from you and stay tuned for the next episode. Um, We're going to dive into, uh, if you're watching live, we're going to go right after this into Belarus and Lebanon and their struggles with corruption. (laughs) 